Before I start to share my ideas with you, I want to give you something that's going to help you be a better communicator. Now, just trust me, this, this, this uh, I hope I have enough for everyone. It's a number two pencil. And the number two pencil is not sharpened because it's actually going to help you speak, not to write. Now, of course, you can sharpen. I hope I have enough for everyone. Because there are so many ways that we communicate. Sir, would you like a pencil? OK. Thank you. Oh, I think I might just make it. Thank you. OK. And some of them are not verbal. One thing you may not know is that the majority of the way we communicate has nothing to do with the words that we, we use. It's nonverbal. Short, and I'm short one. It's okay. Okay. Uh, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm a library staff member. Okay. <laughs> well, you can get your own pencil then. <laughs> okay. Terrific. Okay, I have a question for you. How many times did you speak today? How many times did you speak today? To, to, your, to your partner? To your dog? To your cat? to make a dental appointment, to call your boss to say you were going to be late because you were coming to Creative Zen. <laughs> right? We talk, 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 but we don't speak. We speak, on average, from 7,000 to 20,000 words a day. Now, you might be thinking, women are more loquacious than men. <laughs> By a little bit, not much. But we speak words. But what meaning do we bring to those words? What, how responsible and how conscious are we of the power of those words to change your life, the life of others, to leave your imprint on the world and make things better for everyone? Each of you has that power. The idea is to be conscious and use your words wisely because people's attention spans are very short. We only have seven seconds to make a good impression. Seven seconds. Seven seconds that you first saw me, that you first saw Evan, that you met someone here. That is indelible because we know you really don't have a second chance to make a good first impression, right? So the way we walk into a room, the words we say, our facial expressions, our entire body is engaged in the act of communication. And so we can't take that for granted because my goal today is to help you elevate and unleash the natural speaker in you. It's, this is the currency of life, is communication. And it under, my, underlines and supports everything we do. We're just not aware of it. We take it for granted. So when I ask you, did you speak today? How many words did you speak today? Imagine if every word was imbued with consciousness and awareness of your ability, that energy that you're putting out there into the world by expressing your ideas through words. Warren Buffett, who you all know, was a chronic stutterer, and he was also tremendously afraid of speaking. He put himself through tons of programs. Of course, we know he was successful. But he attributes a lot of his success to communication. He says, if you can master communication, you can double your net worth. And he knows what he's talking about. But we're not talking about financial, necessarily. That's one important part of our lives. What's really important is the connection between mind and heart. Mind and heart. Because research tells us that the best way to get to the mind is through the heart. Feelings, emotions, lived experiences, and the, and the storytelling that, that comes with the, that emotion, and how we each are storytellers. Research also tells us that eye contact, that, that, that direct eyeball to eyeball, is one of the most important connectors that we can use to establish trust credibility, authenticity. And the communication that I want you to think about is your natural, your truth, speaking your truth. Which is why I am on, talking about boots, I am on a mission to slay the dragons of bad communication. It's my mission. It really is. 
and I'm passionate about it. So if you look at the dragons as figurative, they're allegorical, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for all things that get in the way of your power when you speak. All things real or imagined that get in the way of your ability to connect with other human beings in a meaningful way. Most of those are imagined. Very few of them are actually really physical or present. And if they are, we know we can overcome them if we simply determine that we want to get our voice out and make that difference in the world. We are drowning in information. Drowning in information. Overload. Overload everywhere. Digital, uh, external billboards. I mean, this, there's no way that we can consume or process all the information out there. But with all that clutter, we are drowning but hungry, hungry for meaning, hungry for connection, hungry for a sense of purpose, a grounding, a spirited place where we can claim our own and know that we have a purpose. And we know that bad communication, bad communication has tremendous negative effects. It ruins teamwork. It can actually undermine companies, fractures organizations. It ruins careers and reputations. Anyone here who's in communications knows how easily reputations can, can go under. Right? It also hurts families, creates trauma, generational trauma. When, when children take that, 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 that pain with them and it's not allowed to express itself in a positive way. People-to-people -people communication is the oldest way of connecting with other humans. If you think back, way before there was anything to write on, even before there were cave walls to, to paint on, everything that humans communicated was verbal. Stories, legacies, even if the kings would, would go around and telling stories instead of having, because nobody could read. Right? So everything was done verbally. So the power of the word was what ruled the world for centuries before the printing press or before the clay tablets. So just imagine that that, that is now eroding. It's eroding based on technology, digital overload. AI is now threatening to speak for us, write for us, reproduce our images. And we know that Generation Z, they live, well, they are born with a device in their hands, and they live with a device in their hands. And I have to tell you, I've been asked to teach middle and high school children how to speak because they don't know how to. They communicate via texting, TikTok, and the, and the personas that they create through their devices. So if this is the future generation, I think we're in trouble with our communication, aren't we? Communication is a currency. These are my books. I have like 60 books on public speaking, and I keep collecting them. I haven't written mine yet. Soon it's coming. But it's so important to, to really understand the underpinnings of communication. I'm passionate about, about my work as a public speaking coach because it was a time when I couldn't speak at all. I couldn't speak at all. I was a child coming from Cuba at age seven. I went into a very, very traumatic situation being put in a boarding school for three years where I was the only child who spoke Spanish. And so I was in this, 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 this new place where I had no one. My mother and father weren't there. And so I went silent. I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't speak Spanish. I couldn't speak English. I just went silent for a good year. But after I emerged from that, I became a stutterer. I started to stutter very badly. And I did that well into my 30s. So that, that impediment, that was my dragon. Stuttering was my dragon, but I wasn't alone because three million, three million Americans stutter. We know that our president stutters. And it's, it's a disfluency that many people are embarrassed about, but it's real. But we can still communicate. <coughs> However, it does affect the perception of people who stutter. 
So much so that Demosthenes, Demosthenes was a, a, a Greek orator, but what makes him famous, is, as far as public speaking is concerned, where I relate to him when I heard his story, is that he had to claim his fortune and defend himself before the courts. But he stuttered. Nobody wanted to pay attention to him. That was the time of the great orators, right? Aristotle and Plato, and they would stand you know, on these monuments and pronounce you know, philosophy. But he couldn't do that. People laughed at him. So what did he do? He decided he was going to shave his head, go into a, a bunker for three months. And when his hair grew back, he knew the three months were, were finished. He used to use p uh, pebbles in his mouth, pebbles in his mouth, and find all imaginative ways to get rid of his stutter. After the three months, when his hair grew back and he came out, he was able to go before the judges and defend his case. So there is so much of a precedent in terms of the importance of defending your case. Defending your case, you know that prisoners, prisoners in jail, who are serving light sentences, but they have to go to parole. And they have to defend themselves before the parole board. They don't know how to speak for themselves. And very often, it results in them staying in jail a lot, a lot longer. What consequences, right? What consequences there are to not being able to speak your truth, tell your story? The dragons that keep us from those stories are very common. You probably know this one. Fear. Fear. There's, a, there's an actual medical term for it. It's called glossophobia. Write that down. So you can you do a, 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 a trivia quiz with, with a neighbor. Do you know what glossophobia is? Yes, it is fear of public speaking. It is fear of public But it's more than that. It's social anxiety. It's fear of, of, of embarrassment. It's fear of ridicule, like Demosthenes was. Now, is there anyone here who has not felt nervous at a time when you had to speak. Anyone who has never been, uh, you're, 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 you're breaking my rhythm here because usually someone raises a hand and I say, liar, liar, <laughs> because everyone feels it at some time or another. Mark Twain said that there are two types of speakers. Okay, those who are nervous and those who are liars. <laughs> so maybe your dragon is that you are an introvert, and you think that only extroverts can communicate comfortably, right? Introverts, shy, withdrawn, right? Extroverts out there, theatrical, flamboyant. That's not true. That's, that's a misunderstanding. Introverts organize their ideas privately. They're more methodical, more thorough in their thinking. They're formulating, choosing their words. Extroverts may be more impulsive at the time that they have to share something. And as a case in point, Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, they were all introverts. And there are many, many more who we will never find out about, but that's, that was there because they knew that they had to overcome any degree of shyness because they had a role to fulfill. They had to save the world. Maybe your dragon is that you have sloppy speaking, that you tend to use um, ah, uh, you know, like. I mean, you've heard them over and over again, but the one that's really like sticks under my skin is like, like, it's like this, it's like that. Particularly younger generations use like constantly. That's called filler words, it's clutter. You gotta declutter your speech. But this also is also lazy speech. Your vocabulary. How many words do you acquire? I mean, there's 170,000 words in the English language. 170,000, and most people in a lifetime only really work with 20,000. Look at all the potential to add other words to express meaning of what you wanna say. Another dragon. Listening, listening. We never learn how to listen. Our, our mothers and fathers might say, sit down and listen to me. That's not the way to teach somebody to listen, right? Listen is as important as speaking. It's circular. You can't do one without the other. 
As a matter of fact, the best way to listen is to be in silence. In silence. And allow the sounds and those, those, those vibrations come to you. To listen without thinking about what you're going to say. Have you heard someone say, I had a great vacation, I went to Aruba, and you're not really listening. You're listening and all the while thinking about, I'm going to tell them about my vacation. My vacation was better than that. We have that tendency. So you're not listening. What a beautiful thing. You gift somebody attention when you listen. Yes? Now, I think this last dragon, there's many more, but these are like the top ones. Body language. Body language. We were going through the meditation where we were asked to sit straight, right, to, to fill our lungs with air. Body language says so much. It, there's a whole study, there's, there's a science to body language. Facial expressions, your gestures, your hands, and your body's an extension of your, of your voice. And by the way, the voice is like your fingerprints. No one has your voice. No one. It's unique to each and every one of you. Isn't that magical? No one sounds like you. So how you put all this together, how you use your body to express what you want to say, how you invite or you reject people by where you stand, how you stand. These, these are obviously not, not very favorable body positions when you're trying to be a good communicator and make that first impression, those first seven seconds in the world. The most powerful aspects of body language and gesture is eye contact, looking people straight in the eye. And that applies as well when you're doing video communication, when you're on Zoom. Got to look at that lens, because in that lens are the teeny, weeny, 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 weeny people in there. But they're in there. If you envision that it's people at the other end, not a plastic lens, you start to feel that connection. But the eye contact on video as well as in person makes the difference between trust and credibility or the opposite, right? And we need trust. We need to be able to work together and trust each other because we're all in this together, aren't we? The other is a smile. Smile. It is a universal connector. Go anywhere on earth, smile at someone, and they know what it means. And they know what it means. Now, there are many different types of smiles. There's the forced smile, you know, the tight-lipped smile, you know, and, the, and the, the, the sarcastic smile. I'm not very good at mimicking them, but you've seen them. But the real, authentic, genuine smile, according to scientists, is called the Duchenne smile. Duchenne. It's a French last name. There was a gentleman about 100 years ago who studied these things, studied body language, and studied smiles. And his name was Duchenne. And so he then classified that the smile that's the most genuine is the one that shows teeth, wrinkles the eyes, okay, and engages all the zygomatic muscles in the face. And it does something else. It brings the individual a sense of joy, a sense of happiness. And so therefore, there is a scientifically proven technique that if you take your pencil and you put it between your teeth, You can simulate the sensation. Come on, do it with me. That's why I gave you the pencil. <laughs> the sensation of happiness. The sensation, there is a, there's chemicals that go to your brain. Showing teeth, wrinkling the eyes, right? Very simple. Very, very simple. And, and you can do it when you're in a bad mood. You know, do it when you're in the car and you want to kill the person in front of you. <laughs> Possibly the person in the other, in the other lane is going to say, what is going on here? But it's true. It happens. And the smile is extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, useful. Now, what is the antidote to bad communication? How do we get through? How do we deal with all these dragons? How do we... Find our place, our voice. Well, I have a secret formula for you. It's so powerful. It's, it's sharper than the, than the best dagger. 
it will, it will, if not wound, but might kill all those dragons that are keeping you from your best use of your voice and ideas to change the world. It's called bliss. It's called bliss. It is a remarkable, simple formula for some things you can do, and I'm going to explain what they are, that we've already started doing here. It is, it is something that is innate in who you are and what you do. Because the first one is breath. Breath. Breath, inhale is inspiration. Exhale is expression. Stand tall. Fill your lungs with air. Understand that your voice comes not from your throat and from your larynx and from your vocal folds, but from all of you. You need the air, you need the energy. Voice is energy. So you need a good breath, right? When you're nervous sometimes, you run out of breath, right? You, you, want, to, you want to say so many things and then <laughs> you run out of breath. Understand the breath is what makes your voice work. So breath is part of bliss. The next one is love, love. Why love? Because they say that if you don't love yourself, you can't love another. And if you don't love your audience and respect them and show them that you care, the communication doesn't matter. So show the love of your topic and share that love with others. That authenticity will make all the difference in the world. The other one is imagination. Imagination. Envision yourself climbing that mountain, being in front of that audience and hearing the applause. Envision yourself being able to influence someone, to persuade, to inspire, to coach, to help someone in trouble, to lend a hand, to support a cause that you care about. Envision yourself being that change maker. The imagination can help you. Hold it in mind. The first S is service. Service. You're providing a service. Your ideas can be significant catalysts to change. Share your ideas. Be of service to others. Give of yourself as Evan does in terms of simulating the cultural community here, bringing people together. Be of service. Show up. Give people your attention. And the last one is, of course, my, uh, my favorite, the smile. <laughs> the smile. Bliss, B-L-I-S-S. -S. The last S is for smile. It won't fail you. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist uh, philosopher, said that a smile is a beautiful sound. A smile is a beautiful sound. And you can make that sound every day, every day. So my friends, bliss is your way to achieve all those things that are innately yours, to, to find the natural speaker in each and every one of you. You may be saying, no, 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 I get too nervous. Oh no, I don't have the right vocabulary. Oh no, I, I, I'm an introvert and, and, I, and I can't do that because it's not in my nature. You'd be surprised. Find your bliss. Be of service. Love your audience. Love yourself. Know that you have a place in the world and that your ideas, your words, can make a difference in the world. You have the power. It just takes one voice to make that difference. And so, help me slay the dragons of bad communication. Find your bliss. And thank you for listening today. Oh, and, up, and by the way, to, saying, yes. to be in touch with me, you can, you can take that QR code. So uh, before we open up the Q&A, what are some ways that people can engage you personally, professionally? Help individuals who have a particular situation that you need to ace. Maybe it's a speech, maybe it's a, a, a training, or maybe it's a, even, I work with people on wedding toasts and, uh, and ceremonies, uh, on, on, uh, on annual meetings, on pitches for, for investors. Uh, I work with young people who are interviewing for college entrance, okay, or applying for internships. Uh, so I, I work with individuals, which is what I love because I can get really close to you and understand what your needs are. I also do team uh, training in presentation skills, on branding, 
and just overall um, you know, executive communication. I do virtual training as well. So I do workshops. And so I, it's very, it's, I, I'm starting this summer, I started a summer camp uh, which with a, with a small group to really uh, do more of a deep dive on everyone's uh, needs to up level and uh, figure that you know summer is a, a time to play, but it's also a time to catch up on on your skills. So when you come back in the fall, you'll be much more prepared. So please, this is my website. Please feel free to contact me to join my mailing list. I put out a blog every week, and I have a series of videos that uh, hopefully you'll find helpful. And for, I briefly brushed over Pecha Kucha, but could you? Sure. Okay. So we met through uh, Pichikucha, which is, uh, Jackie, still, you're still here. You're Japanese. She writes Pichikucha, Pichikucha, right? Chit-chat. Chit-chat, which means chit-chat. It is a Japanese form of short storytelling, okay? And Evan did, did, uh, did a Pichikucha. It's available on pichikuchamia.com, which is the website for the Miami group. There's more than 1,200 cities where these nonprofits, volunteers come together. And the beauty of it is that it is 20 slides that advance automatically every 20 seconds. So you're talking 20 seconds, you gotta go to, to something else. You gotta transition into a related topic or something else. And it just keeps going. It's not gonna stop for you. And the beauty of it is that it forces you to be totally prepared and to interplay with the slides and to have a dance with the slides. You have a total of seven minutes to talk. That's it. And you'd be surprised how much information you can share in those seven minutes. And it is a wonderful way of storytelling. I use it to teach executives who are long-winded, verbose, death by PowerPoint, reading the text from slides. <laughs> I use it to show them how they can do it differently. Now, they don't, they're not going to do a Pechacucha in front of the board, but they're going to start to see that it's possible to be much more br- brief, concise. Okay? Because when you're brief, you also show more conviction. You show that you're more on top of your material. Right? People can only process so much. So the Pechacucha is it's a lovely way of, of storytelling. We've got all the videos from the last four years uh, on the website. So you can see Evan, myself, and many others. And it is... Uh, it's, it's a name that people don't really know, but if you think of it phonetically, Pecha, P-E-C-H-A, K-U-C-H-A. It started in Japan 20 years ago, and it's all over the world, and it is just delightful, and uh, hopefully you'll come back and you'll do another Pecha Kucha sometime soon. Okay. Or we invite all of you to come. Our next event is September 19th, September 19th, and if you go to our, the website, pechacuchamia.com, you'll see the notice of the, uh, it's, it's free, it's free. So you just basically, you need to make a reservation and you'll see the location. It will be in Miami-Dade, however. It won't be here. But maybe one day we'll and do one here. And now three of the last four speakers, Angela and Nesky, and now yourself, yes. were Pecha Kucha speakers. Yes, so exactly. That. Yes, yes. Uh, you two. And you two. And you two. That's oh. right, yes. Yeah. We're a growing community. Yes. Uh, any questions from the uh, audience for our speaker? I don't yes. It's kind of a combination of two questions. I'm very impressed with, well, a statement and two questions. Very impressed with the story. I'm curious about this. What is one of your greatest accomplishments based on the communication, the communication side? And what has it inspired you to further do with the rest of your life? Ooh, thank you. What a lovely question. Very thoughtful question. The best way I can answer that is when I was invited to be an on-air contributor for MSNBC. That was in its initial first couple of years. I was the token Latina Hispanic. There was a a diverse group of, (laughs) they had to be diverse, uh, of, of individuals around the table commenting extemporaneously on the news of the day. It was live, but the real challenge was they didn't give you a heads up. We're going to be talking about this topic, this topic, this. You, show, you showed up and then you were on the air and you were asked to talk about something that you knew nothing about. How do you finesse it so that you're not saying, I don't know anything about it, but say something intelligent or play off of someone else who may have known about it or maybe the introduction that the anchor gave. And that to me was the best school that I've ever had. It was live. When I saw the red tally light on the camera, it means it's live. It's there. There's no second chance. It was just, it was energizing because I'm saying, this is sink or swim. And so the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it because it was, every day was challenging. So it's a matter of what it is, it's mindset. Always having something you can say 
that makes you sound intelligent. Always finding a hook, playing off of someone else. Finding phrases and concepts that are general enough that, that allow you to enter the topic and not sound like you're, like you're a novice. So it's preparing. If anyone's done Toastmasters, anyone done, done Toastmasters here? OK. Do you, do you remember table topics? Table topics is two minutes of impromptu speaking. You're not prepared. You're just, sometimes you don't know what you're going to talk about, right? And you have to figure it out. So that was my best experience. It really was my school. That was about 20 years ago. And that experience really gave me even more ammunition to do what I'm doing today. Wow. And also, I guess another one that I mentioned during the intro part of your bio was you pivoted to create the Zoom sport. Yeah, yeah. Uh, during the, uh, the lockdown, because uh, I started my business at the end of 2019. And of course, the world changed in 2020. And I said, what, how am I going to grow my business? So I recognized that people were really struggling with how to deal with Zoom, Teams, you know, all the Skype and, and all the other forms of video communication. How do you survive there? How do you engage and make it as human as possible? Right? How do you show up? How do you light yourself? How do you frame yourself? What, what do you wear? What do you do with your background? So I created a 10-point system that guides people through check, 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 good audio, good lighting, good eye contact, uh, good background, and all the different aspects that when you show up, you look like someone that you want to do business with. And it makes you feel confident, and then you can get right to business, as well as how to conduct a meeting so it's shorter, right? It's, it's less, less of a drag on people, because it's tiring to look at a screen uh, for, for many hours. So that's, that's what I did. And, and I was hoping that when we came back to the real world that it wouldn't be necessary anymore, <laughs> but it still is. <laughs> Yeah. I like a good Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? I have a quick question for you. Yeah. So you have had an opportunity to work with a diverse amount of people and obviously in different industries. How do you pivot from one industry to another to be able to still provide them the tools of good I enjoy that very much because I get an inside peek at industries that I would ordinarily not have a chance. Like, for example, I finished recently with a client who is a marble importer. A marble <laughs> importer. I didn't know anything about marble. I didn't know the difference between quartz, marble, uh, and natural stone, and coming from Turkey, and this and that, and matching colors. And so it was interesting to, to give him talking points and to make him more fluent in the way he described his business. I needed to have a little bit of insight into his business. So I do enjoy, enjoy that because it's a uh, it, it, it really keeps me sharp and uh, gives me uh, insights into a multitude of, uh, of different areas in the world that I wouldn't ordinarily see. And you have to have the context in order to be able to coach people accordingly. <laughs>